All right. How many people in the audience have heard of a bait car? All right, a few people. For those that have it, a bait car is just what it sounds like. A car that looks easy to steal that cops have set up to bait thieves. Undercover cops place bait cars in high crime areas and leave the car unattended to try and catch would-be car criminals. Unbeknownst to criminals, they are caught in the act. The cops set up video cameras and radio trackers in the dashboard. Now, I personally think the idea of bait car is great. You set up a trap for would-be criminals, and cops are able to capture them more easily. The concept of a bait car is a good one because it exploits the predilection of the intended target. It allows the police the luxury in being lazy in finding car thieves. Why take risks and spend money trying to find car thieves after they've done the damage they're already going to do anyway, when you can trick them into revealing themselves before they have a chance to steal anyone's car? Being lazy, in this sense, is being smart. So what if we could figure out a similar way to be lazy when detecting diseases like cancer? What if we could get the cancer cells to reveal themselves before they have a chance to harm their intended target? <clears throat> cancer does most of its harm when it spreads uncontrollably in a process known as metastasis. Um, in breast cancer patients, before uh, breast cancer, excuse me, in breast cancer patients, 99% of breast cancer patients will survive the disease five years after the initial treatment before the cancer has a chance to spread. Unfortunately, the breast cancer patients, the, the survival rate plummets to a staggering 25% when the cancer has the opportunity to spread uncontrollably to organs such as the brain, lung, liver, and bone. The best thing we can do is to try and detect cancer metastasis before it has a chance to spread in order to increase the chances of saving a patient's life with the administration of earlier treatments. Now I want to give you some perspective as to why cancer metastasis is so difficult to treat. And to try and do that, let me throw another metaphor at you. Cancer spreads very much in the way that humans have spread throughout the planet. Experts in world history believe that humans originated in the region now known as Africa and have spread over thousands of years with 7 billion current inhabitants. Despite this spread, I think I would argue it would be very difficult to get, human, to get rid of humans over, from the planet. As humans, we are extremely good at using our available resources to survive and spread. We are ruthless at this. We use our planet's resources to plant farms, harness electricity, and build cities. I think a good example of this is how we were able to build a city like Las Vegas in the middle of a seemingly uninhabitable desert. <laughs> as it turns out, tumor cells are just as ruthless in using their available resources to survive and spread. Now here, we have, a fig we have this figure here showing a primary tumor, a bone marrow, and a target organ, such as the lung, and they're all connected via the circulatory system. To begin the process of metastasis, a primary tumor sends signals to the bone marrow to stimulate the release of immune cells. Now, unlike other diseases where immune cells, shown here in green, help fight off invading sickness, tumor cells have keenly developed strategies to force immune cells to accumulate at a target organ and help set up a tumor cell's future home. Then, as immune cells prepare this home, tumor cells then follow signals from the immune cells to accumulate at a target organ and form a metastatic tumor. <coughs> now, let's go back to our friend the bait car. If you could describe my thesis research in one sentence, it would be, I am designing a bait car for cancer cells. <coughs> Remember, a bait car works because it's lazy. It exploits what the target was going to do anyway. Now, let's, let's add our bait car to the system. Essentially, we are designing implantable materials that will first recruit immune cells to the implant site and set up a tumor cell's future home. Then, tumor cells will be lured to our material away from target organs for detection purposes. In fact, I have a sample of this material here in my pocket. <coughs> Imagine, this seemingly magical material can make cancer detection so easy, it could save thousands, if not millions, of lives. 
And if everyone looks into their seat, everyone gets their own cancer detector to take home with them today. <laughs> Obviously, I'm totally kidding. Maybe, maybe we can start a raffle for this one after the conference. <laughs> Now my specialization for my doctorate in biomedical engineering is in biomaterials. And the goal of the field is to use materials, much like the material in this test tube, that elicit a specific biological response once implanted into the body. We first needed to choose a material that would first recruit immune cells and would then subsequently recruit tumor cells. Our material of choice was polylactide goglycolide, or PLG for short. PLG is a polymeric material that is already FDA approved and is often used to make surgical sutures. In our lab, we have used PLG to fabricate these implantable materials known as scaffolds to generate these elegant large pore implants, much like a sponge. The large pores allow for blood vessels to infiltrate the material and allow and give tumor cells access to the scaffold. In one of our first experiments, we injected breast cancer cells in the mammary breast fat of a female mouse to generate our mouse model of breast cancer. Interestingly, these tumor cells were genetically engineered to carry a luminescent reporter so that we could detect them lighting up. We allowed this tumor to grow for seven days and then, implant, then implanted our scaffold material in the abdominal cavity fat pad. We first allowed immune cells to infiltrate the material and set up a tumor cell's future home. Then, as tumor cells begin to circulate through the mouse, they arrive to and populate the scaffold. Then tumor cells do something very interesting. They increase the stiffness of the scaffold environment in order to improve their chances of survival at this new location. And you'll see why this is important in a minute. We have performed experiments, and as you can see, 21 days after implanting our material, we can see tumor cells being lured to our scaffold implant site compared to a fat pad that never received a scaffold. We've also performed experiments where we can detect tumor cells at our material implant site as early as seven days post scaffold implantation. And in most cases, we were able to detect tumor cells at our material prior to their arrival at the brain, lung, and liver. Now, unless you're like my friend, Mr. Burns here, you probably haven't worked in a nuclear power plant, and you do not have cells that light up. We needed to devise a strategy to image the arrival of tumor cells to our material implant site without the use of luminescent reporters in order to, in order to detect tumor cells without the use of luminescent reporters. Currently, it's extremely difficult to detect single tumor cells in the body without the use of luminescent reporters. CT scans, such as the image I show here, can detect relatively large tumor masses, as evidenced by the dark gray tumors scattered throughout this liver. Our solution to this single cell detection problem was found at your local eye doctor's office. Now, since I'm blind as a bat, I get my retinas imaged every year to make sure there have been no significant structural changes in the tissue structure. The eye doctor uses this imaging technology called optical coherence tomography, or OCT, to image the retina in exquisite detail. In collaboration with Professor Vadim Bachman here at Northwestern, his lab has developed a modified version of this imaging technology called inverse spectroscopic optical coherence tomography, or ISOCT. I know, it's a mouthful. ISOCT is essentially a light scatter based technique capable of detecting subtle differences in tissue stiffness. Now, remember, when tumor cells arrive to our scaffold site, they make the scaffold environment stiffer. Therefore, ISOCT can be used as a method to detect this increase in stiffness, thus allowing us to detect tumor cells on our material implant site. And interestingly, using our mouse model of breast cancer, we've been able to detect this increase in stiffness at our scaffold. They're therefore giving us the ability to detect tumor cells without the use of luminescent reporters. When I talk to my family and friends about this research, they often ask me how this technology can be used in a patient one day. In a future clinical setting, a breast cancer patient would go to the doctor's office with a primary tumor in the breast. Depending on the size of the tumor, or depending on the stage of the tumor, the mass would be removed, and a scaffold would be implanted under the skin 
near the original tumor site, ideally before metastasis occurs. <coughs> then during a regular checkup, ISOCT would be used to monitor the stiffness of the scaffold. Here, the scaffold has a healthy baseline stiffness. However, if the disease were to recur, tumor cells would populate the scaffold and increase the local stiffness. Then using ISOCT, we can detect this increase in stiffness, thus allowing us to detect cancer metastasis earlier. Our lab is currently making efforts to get these materials to the clinic as soon as possible. Of course, this work would not have been possible without the mentorship and leader of the project, Professor Lonnie Shea, in addition to my esteemed research colleagues, Team Tumor. Working with these team members has been the absolute joy of my professional career. Detection of metastatic disease at its earliest stages could transform how we care for cancer patients. Our material, our bait car for cancer cells, can enable the early detection of cancer metastasis and increase the chances of saving the lives of our loved ones. Thank you. <laughs>